I'm going to speak today mostly about Serial Season 2. I was the community editor there for Season 2, um, but perhaps at the end or at the panel this afternoon that I'm also on, we can talk about some of my previous work. I've worked with Al Jazeera, BBC, Doctor Who, um, live tweeted Arab Spring, um, and I also have my own um, indie food magazine called Saucy, so happy to talk about that. Um, but I'm going to be using mostly cereal and mostly tweets uh, today because it's, it's us. So once more with feelings. Okay, so we're having a moment where a distinctive voice is very valuable um, in news and in, and in online. With cereal, Sarah has a very, uh, she has a signature style. And she uses self-deprecating humor to guide the listener through. This is incredibly important for long-form content because you want the listener to stay with you for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, for an hour. So you have to keep reminding them of how you got to where you are. So she'll use self-deprecating humor often to sort of tell you how she worked through her thought process. So you don't, as the listener, you don't have to feel weird about um, oops, let's go back. Um, you don't have to feel weird about being curious or being confused about something. That's incredibly valuable uh, for the listener. So what she's done is she's figured out how to say it so the audience will hear it. It may be beautifully written, but if the audience doesn't get it, you haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay. Ah, are you going to dance? Did I do that wrong? Again? There we go. I like it when Groot dances. Um, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit using this one, but I love it too much. Um, so this is how we want our audiences to feel. This is always a challenge to do with news content, but they might be really excited about it because it's you, because they trust you, they want to read your take on whatever's just happened, or they know that you're going to point them to someone that they will also enjoy. So this is the feeling that you're always going toward. And you also want them to feel that way about other people who are also in the same audience, who are also following you. Um, I see a lot of things that happen in news that are hard to share. So it may be that you've conveyed the information, but it's hard to like it or heart it or share it. Um, so often you can flip the frame or do something that's sort of the layer out from that. And that's, I think, something that we want to really think about um, how to do is flipping the frame so that people can share it. Um, as there we go. Um, as podcasts become more and more of a thing, even though it's an old format, I see a lot of this sort of idealized consumption environment narrative happening, and nobody's ever going to be in a perfect place, be really happy and excited, and have perfect clarity when they listen to your stuff. This reminds me a lot of that illustration that we're all very familiar with, of the white nuclear family, and they're all sitting around in the living room, gazing adoringly at the TV, and all getting along with each other. We know that's a fantasy. We know that this is also a fantasy. So you want to think about someone who's coming into your content, they're stopping, they're starting, they're doing other things, they're not going to be able to listen to it with perfect clarity. And how do you work with that? Um, we certainly saw this uh, this week with Leslie Jones uh, retweeting her haters. Um, and what I did a lot of was taking things to the back channel. So when you're trying to figure out, um, and I would recommend making a very detailed social calendar, social editorial calendar, when you're trying to figure out where to put something and how to put something up, then you want to think about which spaces are moderated and which are not. A lot of the time, we'll see questions being asked that are never going to lead to good places. Um, so there are ways to take conversations to the back channel. It's hard to illustrate what sort of a value that has to the community sometimes. So make sure when you do that, that the rest of the team is aware of how much time uh, you're spending doing that. Um, I use Tumblr a lot in Serial for season two because you can chat with it in the back channel. You can do messaging with it on the back channel. We used it um, in, to do something that we weren't comfortable with the site 
doing. So Tumblr was, was sort of a second site for us in a way. So people could ask questions, and they could ask questions anonymously, which was very valuable. We didn't have to answer them, but we could if we wanted to, and we could answer them publicly on the Tumblr, or we could answer them privately to the user themselves. So I think that was very valuable for the audience. We certainly got a better sense of what people were interested in, frustrated by, needed to know more about from having it be in the back channel. Not everyone is comfortable with publicly sharing because we have to be comfortable with publicly sharing and being sort of a public persona. That doesn't mean that your audience is. Um, also, online spaces can feel haunted, especially by previous successes and failures. Um, so you want to think about taking it to another platform um, if you can and if it's appropriate. So the audience is always changing. And something that has worked before might not necessarily work again. Something that I find really important to think about when I'm, I'm working on social is thinking about the fact that you're always creating an archive. So the audience, especially with long form content, is probably going to change its mind, perhaps about one character, often within the consumption of one episode, right, or one piece. So you want to be able to be flexible and have enough play in the voice that it's large enough for people to be able to change their mind and their opinion. And they don't necessarily feel dumb about having felt one way and now feeling a different way by the end of the episode. Um, I usually try to find different audience members for each segment of the audience that's very key or that we're trying to identify and then tracking them over a period of months or years. So you're looking for sentiment through actual humans. You're not necessarily relying on platforms that sometimes do this for us really well. Um, but you know what's important. And I like to go in and identify someone who's a super fan, somebody who's sort of a fan, somebody who hates it, um, and someone who's sort of uninvolved, and then see how they react to different pieces of news, to different pieces of content that are from the show, the organization, and pieces that are not. And just sort of tracking their responses as you go will give you a better sense of, of what's actually happening. Because when you're just looking at volume of responses on something, that's not always going to give you the right sentiment analysis that, that you need. So, so look to the humans. Oops, come back. All right. Um, Anti-patterns often seem like a great idea, especially to administration, um, especially to, to management. Um, what I'm doing here, this was, this was Serial's first poll. And what I'm trying to do is offer a way to give us structured responses. So for Serial season two, we had to change the release schedule about halfway through. That's never great because you have an audience expectation, which is that the thing will be released weekly. They don't really want to talk so much about it. They want the stuff. They want to know when to get the stuff, whenever it is, and where to find it. Um, but going backwards to weekly was never an option. So I'm addressing that above the poll. So it says for, for people that I uh, can't read it, um, question, which is clearer for us to use? And then in parentheses, we'd all like a weekly option. We hear you. Thanks for your support. So you have thanked them. You said, yeah, this is why this option isn't on there. And then the two options are bi-weekly and fortnightly. Uh, this was an, an incredibly um, interesting poll. It was very close. It was 51% bi-weekly in the end. Um, but fortnightly is such an excellent word. Um, congratulations on that, by the way. Um, and it was very close, and people felt very passionately about it. But again, this is not about the reporting itself. This is about the release schedule. So we could have some fun with it, and we could connect the community together and how they felt about it. Um, again, setting expectations there. Uh, this is a parody account. It's a fake daycare. And in their Twitter bio, they say, we do not accept immunized children. And all of the children in this fake daycare have absurdist names. So this was something they didn't tag us. But I don't always trust all the systems, so I'll go in and do my own searches and, and be looking through alerts to see. Um, and I found this tweet and thought it was funny. Um, I tweeted at the account itself. So only a super fan would even see this or someone that's following both accounts. Um, and I'm using their syntax. So I'm using the fact that they have all of these kids with these really silly names. So I came up with you know, this fake kid. 
um, that again continues this joke of fortnightly um, so that people could say, oh, that's funny. And why are we talking about this again? Oh, they're changing their schedule. So again, you're being playful. You're having fun with it. Um, OK. Um, if you're silent, when you're silent, the speculation is going to continue and increase. And that's really good to know. Um, sometimes when you're in a situation where you're getting pressure not to respond, it's good to just start a timer and a clock um, and then have people watch the stream of questions that comes in. Uh, that's pretty useful. So you know that at some point you need to, you need to address it. Um, we had a thing in the fall where we weren't ready to launch the season yet, but we had just announced a partnership. So there was a lot of excitement and interest on when the season was going to begin. And the year before, so this is the audience expectation, they had done a traditional rollout. Because a lot of this is about the launch, right? So they'd done the traditional rollout. They'd put out the first two episodes on This American Life. They'd given people the launch date. People knew what to expect and when it was coming. Um, we didn't want to do the same thing with season two. We sort of didn't need to in the same way because we knew that we had a core audience that was ready and that was signed up and you know had turned on automatic downloads. Um, so this happened on November 22nd. That's American Thanksgiving week. And these two tweets happened within 20 minutes of each other. I saw this when I came out of a call and went, oh, cool, great. Um, but it let me answer without giving away any spoilers. So this was a Google Trends alert. And then, you know, when does season, you know, Serial come back? Soon. When is Serial season two starting? Soon. What is Serial? A podcast. And then be able to announce, again, this thing that we had just started, the Pandora partnership. And then what is the second season of Serial called? Season two. So no spoilers, but it's funny. And because we couldn't do anything else for another couple weeks, it gives people something to come back to. And that could be pinned to the top. Um, and people could keep sharing it so it retains its value. Um, and it gives you a little bit of time. We also wanted them to know that, that we were listening. Um, certainly in the past couple weeks, uh, we've seen a lot of breaking news happen. Um, if you're doing anything that's long form, and if you're doing anything that, that is news and touches entertainment in any way, you're never going to queue content. Um, I, I try to never queue content, um, mostly because if you queue and then something breaking happens, you look tone deaf or uh, you look thirsty. So you never want to do that. Also, whenever Beyonce drops something, um, that you know we're, we're done for the day. Um, so hold if you can on that. Um, you also want to acknowledge where things are in the news cycle. Just because it's your stuff, that doesn't mean that you broke it first. Somebody might have found it first before it went out on social or went out to the community. Um, and what I think you also want to do is figure out how do you add something even if people already know about it. So this is from a moment in the season where we had discussed something from season two that it was already in an episode. So if people were caught up, and they weren't all caught up, a lot of people this season when we changed the schedule then saved a few episodes and listened to them later. So we were tracking their consumption patterns. So we kind of knew that. Um, but we had talked about something already in an episode, and then it broke separately as a news item. So I was looking for a way to recognize that news that was clearly relevant to the group of people that were following. It wasn't necessarily our news, but it was the same piece of information. Um, I'm also borrowing here heavily from the Hamilton fandom stuff and what they do. Lynn is incredible at this. And whenever you can high five people for being smart, that's a great thing. Um, it also creates a sense of belonging. Hey, here's this thing that you already knew because you're up to date um, and, and sort of gives an incentive for that. Um, podcasts are an asynchronous listening experience, but you're always trying to create this sense of togetherness. So I did as an experiment some listening parties in the fall. And what I would do is I would put up a tweet, let people know, set expectations, hey, lots of tweets for the next hour, great. And then um, put up something that's a roll call tweet. And that's really for the audience so that they know that they're not listening alone because they can go in and see, oh, that tweet that they just put up has hundreds of likes on it. Cool. It's not just me sitting at my computer or looking at my phone um, while I'm listening to this. So again, creating that sense of community. And then for this episode, 
there was a moment. At, so the listening parties would happen uh, five to six hours after the episode had gone up. So and most people listen to Serial multiple times. Uh, we just know this from our audience, audience data. So, um, so this wasn't necessarily breaking. It wasn't a first-time listen thing. Um, but there was this moment that happened in the episode where there was a throat clearing. And it was a little bit ambiguous as to whether or not it was intentional or an editing mistake. People love to talk about ambiguity. Um, and you can structure that response. And this was a fun tweet to do within the listening party. Because even people who weren't paying attention to the hashtag or even following along in the listening party, I didn't put the hashtag in this one on purpose um, so that it would show up in everybody's feed. Um, if you had heard the episode already, you knew what we were talking about. And that was fun. And you could smile with it. So that was good. OK. Um, with that and with gifts, and that's partly why I'm using them here today, we still want to talk about moments together. Even within long form content, it's moments that we remember. It's moments that are much easier to return to on social. Um, this photo has been used a lot in different kinds of memes. And the way I want to use it today is talking about fandoms. Um, and Serial is certainly a fandom. When you talk about a fandom, when you talk about the original content, the place that it started, meaning the creator of it, uh, you're talking about canon. And then everything else outside of it um, is, is a little bit removed. So it's either a couple levels removed, or it's very specific. So for Serial, there are companion podcasts. And you know, there's one for season two that was about a military perspective. You can see how that would be appropriate. There was one that was about. Idaho and how that was relevant. There's one that was about crime writing. There are people who listen to those fan and you know we could call them unofficial companion podcasts that were listening to those but not even necessarily listening to the show itself to the original or people who were only listening to the original so that they could follow along with their favorite companion podcasts. There were people that listened to all the companion podcasts. Right? All of that is valid. All of that is interesting. That's also your audience. So we look a lot at traffic and where it comes in from. But you also want to think about where else are people listening to this stuff or going to talk about your stuff um, and why. You know, They may make you cry. They will probably make you cry. Um, but it's good to be aware of, of what they're talking about and how they're talking about it. Um, you're going to get audience responses that you don't quite know what to do with. Um, this came in, and I thought, wow, really? Wallpapers? It's 2016. And then I went, oh, OK, on your phone. Got it. Um, and then I thought, well, we don't want to over-respond to this one tweet that came in randomly. So by retweeting it, you have a, qu a quick, nice way to get some data. right? There's interest or there's not. So there was enough interest here. And then we heard from people privately that were very excited about it and volunteered to do it for free. We did not take them up on that. Um, and we were then able to say, OK, cool, we're going to go ahead and do it. Um, but if we hadn't gotten a response, then we would have been able to reach out to this person individually and say, hey, thanks so much. Um, you know, you know, here's one of the, the files if you want to put it on your phone. Um, but we wouldn't have done it in a big way and put resources against it. So it helped us move quickly address an audience question and not spend too much time with it if there wasn't actually the interest. You don't want to over respond and sort of overweight individual questions. Um, you know, also when, uh, when Serial goes out, a new episode in season two got three million downloads in the first week. So there are eight people on the team. There's one of me. I did all of community. So there's one of me and three million downloads. So you got to do the best you can. Um, this is the holy grail stuff. And this is kind of where we're going to end. Um, and Song Exploder is a really great podcast. They take one song, they speak with the artist, and then they sort of explode. They explicate how they made that song. So it's also kind of heady and, uh, and very focused, and they have a very, uh, you know, very focused audience on what they do. Um, but it's good to be in conversation publicly with other people in your category, in your vertical, in your field. That makes you look stronger and more confident. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more fun as well. Um, and I thought seriously about doing this because I always want to protect, when you have a big enough uh, audience, you want to protect individuals within the community um, from haters and trolling and all this stuff. But in this particular case, this woman had created something that was a logo animation from the first season. So the first season, everybody really loved it. It was unambiguous in that this is only a logo animation with music. It's not even the character 
main character, from the first season. So it wasn't even, you know, which side are you on? It was only the logo animation. So again, something that everybody, it's, it's a universal. Everybody could get around that, could get behind that. Um, it, it had a couple of retweets, it had a couple of likes. That's not the point at all. The point was for the fandom, which they did, to go and celebrate her stuff, to go and like her tweet, and to leave great comments, and they did, on her Instagram. Because um, that's, the, that's the fucking magic. Like, that's how you get there. Uh, and that's what you want to keep celebrating. You want to keep enabling people's best selves.